Welcome everyone and happy, happy new year, new year to you. Here we are, uh, I don't know how many, I guess 20 years uh, that we've been doing these webinars, although back then it was teleseminars. Um, so we didn't have the visual part, <laughs> uh, but really grateful that you are here with us. And I'm extremely grateful to have Rick Sharga uh, here to bring his slides and his insights and data and forecasts to share with us. So I know people are just coming on right now, uh, but we'll go ahead and get started. So Rick, welcome. Great to be here, Kathy. I always appreciate the invitation and always enjoy our conversations. Well, you just really make it so easy on me. I usually spend 30 hours preparing for these and this time that was you that got to do that. <laughs> So thank you. All right, so today, as you know, it's the 2024 housing market predictions with our special guest, Rick Sharga. So we're gonna take a look back at 2023 and looking ahead, more importantly, at what's in store for 2024 based on the data. And, uh, and then I have an upcoming event uh, for Grow Developments. That is our syndication company, which is different than our realty port, you know, our, our brokerage where we, with, with Real Wealth, you're used to us helping you build your personal portfolio. At Grow, you know, there's people who just would rather be completely passive and invest in, in somebody else's deal and let them do all the management and you still get the cash flow and depreciation and all the benefits uh, with someone else doing the work. Um, so we have a live event on Saturday, January 20th from 12 to 3 in Pleasant Hill, California. Uh, we're going to focus on our land development deal in Southern Oregon, uh, Ridgewater LLC with Fred Bates, who we've been partnering with for almost 15 years now, uh, done many successful projects together. And then we'll do an update and last call for our North Texas Rental Fund. That's closing early February. So if you wanted to get in into that, this is the time it's closing. Um, if you want to join us for this live event, and I'll also be doing my forecast, but you're going to get that here today. Um, but you can register for the event at growdevelopments.com. And this disclaimer of just, you know, this disclaimer, make sure we're not giving tax advice. No, no uh, legal advice. Get your own advice <laughs> from your own experts. Uh, we're giving our opinion. Don't hold us to it. <laughs> How's that for my disclaimer? <laughs> All right, and uh, you know about me. I'm the founder of Real Wealth, co-founder with Rich, uh, CEO of Grow Developments, host of the Real Wealth Show and Real Estate News Podcast, and also co-host of Bigger Pockets on the Market, author of Retire Rich with Rentals, where Rich and I are also writing a book with Bigger Pockets that is due the end of the month. So that's where my attention will be this month. And then a market research fanatic, and just so lucky to be friends with people like Rick, who keep all of us updated on the real data, because the headlines mm, don't tell the whole story, and usually the wrong story. <laughs> all right. Is there some subtext in the title, Retire Rich? Are you encouraging him to do something? He came up with that title when I was wondering what the title, I was like, yeah, but I want to retire too. But anyway, yes. <laughs> Okay, and then Rick Sharga. Many of you know Rick. He is the founder and CEO of CJ Patrick Company, a market intelligence and advisory firm for companies in the real estate and mortgage industries. He's an executive with over 30 years experience, named Marketing Executive of the Year by the Stevie Awards, twice named one of the most influential people in real estate by Inman News, which is pretty huge. So again, Rick, so glad you could, you could be here, and I'm going to hand this over to you and probably interrupt you a few times as we go. <laughs> Well, I hope you do, and, and thank you again for, for inviting me. Um, I hope everybody is, is uh, off to a good start in 2024, uh, a year which, I guess, everything being relative, should be better than 2023 if, if you're in the real estate industry, but probably uh, not going to be the, the boom year that, that a lot of people would like. So we're going to take a look at what's going on in the economy. That drives a lot of what goes on in real estate. We'll take a look at the housing market. Some information on foreclosures, in fact, uh, updated since I sent these slides in yesterday, uh, and uh, and then some closing thoughts on what we might uh, see for the for the coming year. So, in the economy, uh, probably uh, probably not a huge shock to anybody, but uh, our, our gross domestic product, our economy, uh, continues to be strong uh, despite uh, pessimistic outlooks and despite all the talk about a recession. And spoiler alert. 
Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the likelihood of a recession in slides to come. Uh, and I tend to be on the side of the fence that things were more likely than not to see a recession. And I'll, I'll explain why I think that might be the case. But third quarter of this year, the last quarter we have reported uh, GDP numbers for, growth rate was 5.2%. And if you compare the U.S. economy to what we're seeing around the world, uh, the Canadian economy uh, was in negative numbers. Uh, the Eurozone was at zero and China was at 1.3%. So the U.S. economy outperforming pretty much everybody around the world right now. Uh, keep in mind that we are connected to that global economy. So if we do see the global economy go into a recession, it's likely to have an impact on the U.S. economy as well. One of the reasons I may not be as bullish as some other people uh, that you're going to hear from. Uh, but the fourth quarter estimates uh, have been for more or less a flat quarter. Um, consumer spending accounts for about two thirds of the, the GDP. Uh, and recent reports uh, suggest to me that we're going to see a little bit more growth in the fourth quarter than the economists had, had forecast. Uh, we saw a huge bump in, in retail expenditures in the quarter, uh, much higher than people had anticipated. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the economy continues to, to chuckle along at a pretty high rate when we see those fourth quarter numbers come out. One of the reasons for that is unemployment numbers are continuing to come in near historically low levels. We've been spoiled by uh, unemployment rates below 4% now, really since about 2020 or since about 2016, with the exception of that spike we saw during the COVID pandemic. Historically speaking, economists will tell you that in the US, if you have a 5% unemployment rate, it means full employment. So that basically everybody who's looking for a job is finding a job. Uh, and we've been below that now really for the last seven or eight years. So it's, uh, it's a very, very strong economy. Whether you're looking at the most recent unemployment claims or you're looking at continuing jobless claims, people that are having a hard time finding a job for a matter of months, both of those numbers are historically low. That, that's a, a big driver in the economy. It's also one of the reasons we're not seeing a lot of foreclosure activity. Um, the reason we see the unemployment numbers as low as they are is there are still more jobs available than there are people looking for work. So at the moment, there's about 6 million people looking for jobs. Uh, there are about 8.5 million jobs available for anybody who's looking. That 8.5 million is down from about 10 million jobs uh, a quarter or so ago. So the, the Federal Reserve is having the desired uh, impact it would like on the jobs market. Um, they're not mean people, but unemployment rates and, and wage growth are both things that contribute to inflation. They're trying to get inflation under control. So a little bit less uh, job availability relative to the number of people looking for work is, is a good thing from the Fed's perspective because when you have more people looking for jobs than you have jobs available, wages go up and that, that contributes a bit to, to inflation. Um, and wages have been growing faster than the rate of inflation now uh, for about the last year. And, and this chart really is looking at uh, wages two ways. Uh, the, the blue bars are hourly wages, and the dotted line is, is uh, wage growth, wage and salary growth on a year-over-year -year basis. So wages have been growing 4 or 5% pretty steadily for the last year, year and a half. Uh, that's a pretty, pretty healthy uh, wage growth, historically speaking. Uh, and hourly wages across the country are now up to about $29 an hour on average. Uh, so you, you can see the impact of, of what wage growth has, has done. Uh, and, and really, again, for the last nine months or so, uh, we've seen those, those wages outpace inflation. So it's really starting to feel for a lot of households much better economically than it had when wages were growing, but inflation was growing faster. Uh, there are some red flags I'd like to share with you, however. This is one. Uh, consumer spending, the blue bars here, you can see continues to, to dramatically increase. Uh, consumer confidence has not kept pace. And normally, uh, there's a correlation between consumer confidence and consumer spending. So the more confident consumers are, the more willing they are to spend. And that's particularly true for high ticket items like houses uh, and automobiles. And consumer confidence plunged during the early days of the pandemic, started to come back. Uh, and then dropped again as we saw subsequent waves of COVID hit, as we saw things like the war in Ukraine, as we saw inflation start to ramp up, 
the cost of living increased, and more recently, the war in the Middle East. So it, it's, it is a disconnect. And as I mentioned, about two thirds of the, the, the economy depends on consumer spending. So there's a concern that we might have a reversion to the mean. We might see consumer spending dry up a bit uh, to, to get back down to levels that consumer confidence would indicate. And we could literally worry ourselves into a bit of a recession. So that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, another red flag here when it comes to consumer spending is what the consumers are using on those expenditures. So in the third quarter of 23, for the first time in history, consumer credit card debt surpassed a trillion dollars, a big, big number, uh, no matter how you, you slice it. And that happened at a time when, because the Fed had been raising the Fed funds rate uh, for two years, we saw credit card interest rates on average for new accounts come in at about 25%. So we've seen the all-time high in terms of credit card use at the same time as we've seen a huge increase in, in credit card interest rates. So the concern here isn't just that people are using their credit cards a lot uh, at high interest rates. It's a, a worry about whether they're using those credit cards to make ends meet. So even though inflation has been coming down a bit, we still see food costs, gasoline costs, energy costs remain pretty stubbornly high. And for, for for households, particularly at median income levels and lower, those necessities take up a higher percentage of their budget. And again, the concern among economists is that people may be rack racking up credit card debt uh, in order to pay for those necessities. That's not a good long-term uh, solution. The other thing on this chart that's a concern is, is a, a similar story, but in the opposite direction in terms of personal savings rates. So if you look at the dotted line, you can see that during the pandemic, when the government sent out stimulus checks, and candidly, there just wasn't much to buy. People were putting the money in the bank. So we saw a huge spike in personal savings rates. After that, we saw those rates hit the lowest levels they've hit historically. They came back a little bit, but are still lower than normal. So again, same concern here is are people tapping into their, their personal savings in order to make ends meet? That's not a good long-term solution either. And I've seen some research that suggests that on average, uh, most U.S. households have more credit card debt than they have in savings. So there are some red flags if you look at consumers going forward uh, that some of this economic data is, is showing us. Uh, good news, and we, we saw some sort of good news today in, in terms of inflation. Uh, the, the CPI report came in. It came in at about 3.9% year-over-year growth, uh, which is still below 4%. It's a good thing. Uh, the, the, the core of the consumer price index looked particularly strong. It was down at about 3%. So, so these numbers are getting closer to what the Federal Reserve is looking for at its 2% uh, rate of inflation. But I wanted to share this with you uh, to show you how unusual what the Federal Reserve did this time uh, is compared to what it's done in prior cycles. So if you go back to 2016 and you see the dotted line inflation started to tick up, you see what the Fed usually does. It, it raised the Fed funds rate a little bit, then waited to see what kind of impact it had. Then it raised it a little bit more. And step by step, gradually, it got that Fed funds rate uh, up to about two and a half, three percent 3%, uh, saw that inflation was starting to get under control, and then and backed off. Uh, a huge drop off when the pandemic was declared, uh, down to pretty much zero interest rates from the Fed funds rate. Uh, because the Fed was was trying to make sure we didn't enter into a really severe recession or even a depression because they weren't sure what kind of impact COVID was going to have on the economy. But the combination of that, of the billions and billions of dollars the Fed uh, put into the market buying uh, securities, buying bonds, uh, the, the increase of the monetary supply of about 50 percent and the supply chain disruption that that made the price of goods and services go up, we saw inflation just skyrocket, uh, peaking over 9%. Uh, and because of the, the dramatic increase, the sudden increase, and the fact that the Federal Reserve is pretty convinced that uh, after all their talk of transitory inflation went away, that inflation wasn't going to be easy to get rid of, uh, you see how quickly and how high they raised the Fed funds rate. And they've only ever done anything like this once uh, in the last 70 years, and that was back in the 80s when we had a, a run-up in, of inflation that got a little bit tough to get rid of as well. So they've had the desired effect. Inflation has been coming down. It obviously roiled the financial markets 
had a huge impact on mortgage and financing rates. Uh, and, and the speculation now is that, that the Fed is done raising uh, and, and should uh, start to, to uh, drop the Fed funds rate as we get into 2024. Um, a lot of speculation on the street that we'll see the first cut in March. I don't buy that. Uh, yeah. I don't think we see a Fed funds cut until probably late May uh, at the earliest. And that, by the way, is more in line with what they've done historically in terms of uh, when they stop raising rates to when they start cutting rates. My question is, is it already too late to avoid a recession based on what the Fed has done? And this is some data from, it was compiled by the uh, the chief economist at, at Fannie Mae using public record data, so I'm not stealing anything here. But if you go back to World War II and you look at each time the Federal Reserve has raised the Fed funds rate in order to get inflation under control, they've done that 11 times, not counting this cycle. In eight of those 11 times, they overcorrected, and that led to a recession. Some large recessions, some small recessions, but led to a recession. The three green arrows you see on the chart are times they avoided a recession and executed what they call a soft landing. And those were all times when they acted proactively and preemptively. So they started raising the Fed funds rate before inflation got too high, before it got too sticky. Uh, and, and I'm not picking on the Fed here. Chairman Powell has already admitted they waited too long this time. Uh, inflation got higher than they expected and has been much more difficult to resolve than they expected. So I, I'm of the opinion that they've already overcorrected uh, and there will be some fallout from this. The other historical data point that suggests that might be the case, <clears throat> excuse me, is something called an inverted yield curve. And without getting too inside baseball on you, it's when the bond market sees uh, kind of a disruption in the force and the yields on a two-year bond, uh, a short-term investment, are higher than the yield on a 10-year bond, a longer-term investment. And if you think about it, that kind of makes sense. If the Fed funds rate is 5.5%, it doesn't make sense um, for, for uh, a short-term investment like a two-year to be much lower than that. Um, and so what we've seen is this inversion. And the last seven times the yield curve has inverted, it's been followed by a recession. So seven for seven. Uh, I don't really see a reason why this eighth time, which has been one of the longest and deepest inversions we've seen, will be any different. The good news, as I mentioned earlier, that the economy is chugging along pretty healthily. If that's a word, if that's a word. I'm not sure healthily is a word, but we're gonna we're gonna call it one today. Um, it's very likely if we do have a recession this year, it will probably be very short and very mild. Uh, so none of the economists that I follow or talk to, uh, who I think are legit, um, are, are expecting to see unemployment get much above 5%. So it shouldn't have a huge, huge impact on the housing market. Historically, what I've noticed is that when, when unemployment goes above 6%, we do start to see an impact on, on the housing market, particularly in new home sales first. So something to watch. Uh, the unemployment rate typically is a good predictor of what's going on in, in foreclosures and mortgage delinquencies uh, and in home sales. So that's that's our, our wrap on the economy. Kathy, anything you wanted to add or, or, or interject at this point before we go into housing? No, no. I mean, it's uh, it's a little scary and it's another unknown place and investors don't like that although it's it is there's a few bizarre things about the economy one is how investors and and wall street have been so excited about the fed pivot thinking that they were going to cut rates all year and and uh and i was not i'm like you i didn't think that was going to be the case that it's going to be much slower and and higher rates for longer uh, but so so what's the disconnect there with Wall Street thinking that the Fed is going to be more generous to us? And then the other thing is with all that wage growth, why are consumers so depressed? <laughs> you know why why has there been this negativity when they're when people are actually making more money generally? Yeah, and and you know I think it's honestly um, we were just having this conversation in my house the other day. Um, it's because what you see as a consumer still hasn't improved very much. Uh, we've seen gas prices actually tick up again in recent weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, food prices really haven't come down. I, I, I've developed my own index, Kathy. I call it the Costco price index. 
Um, and, and I think it really is what plays in consumers' minds. The, mm -hmm. the salmon that I used to buy at Costco a year ago for $9.99 a pound is now $12.99 a pound. And that's not a 3% or 9% increase in inflation. That's a 30% increase. And yeah. I think that's what consumers are still seeing. And mm -hmm. that ouch factor in their in their wallets and their pocketbooks uh, is really kind of diminishing consumer enthusiasm for what's going on in the economy. So there's there's your, your top line numbers, but there's also what we see as consumers every day. And I think I think that's one of the disconnects, but that's one of the reasons I believe the Fed is so adamant about getting overall inflation numbers down. Okay. And then what about Wall Street? Why why has there been so much uh, belief that uh, the Fed is going to lower interest rates substantially this year? <sighs> Wall, Wall Street has a tendency to be overly enthusiastic and overly pessimistic. So you, you very seldom see Wall Street operating at a, a, a happy medium. Um, I think they were elated uh, at Chairman Powell's change in tone. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so the chairman, even while they were, we were holding steady and not raising the Fed funds rate, had maintained a very, very hawkish, aggressive posture and, and kind of kept warning the market that if things revert or, or if they don't improve as expected, they, they might, we might still see some, some more hikes in the Fed funds rate. Yeah. And suddenly in December, he completely reversed course. And I think, I think that tenor is what really changed the mood on Wall Street. Then if you looked at the last report and the Fed's estimate estimate on the Fed funds rate at the end of 2024, it baked in at least three drops, three declines in the Fed funds rate. And mm -hmm. I think that kind of greased the engines a little bit on Wall Street as well. Now, you, you then have the overreaction, the kind of typical overreaction in Wall Street, which is, well, if they're saying three, they must mean six. Uh, and, and so it's probably going to go. Some people were saying eight. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and we're not going to see eight. The, no. Here's the asterisk, the, the caveat I will throw out there. I talked about a recession. I, I still believe that's more likely than not. I would be completely shocked if we don't see one. But if we don't see one, we'll still see the economy slow down pretty dramatically, uh, just because it, it has to reset from, from these, these higher price points, this, these, these higher costs. Um, if we have a more serious and severe recession than I think, we could see the Fed accelerate the, the rate cuts mm -hmm. uh, or have more rate cuts in order to keep the economy from getting into too severe a recession. So that that is one scenario that could play out. But if that happens, there's gonna be other bad things and, and Wall Street will react to those uh, accordingly. So it, I, I really believe what we're seeing is just a little bit of, of an overreaction initially. Um, there has been a lot of pent up investment demand on the street. Uh, there are also people entering the market right now, basically because they think uh, some of the stocks had been hammered enough that they're a good buy. So, you know, the fact that we're sitting here uh, talking about the Dow being at 37,000 points uh, is something I don't think most of us would have predicted six months ago. Um, but uh, a lot will depend on what the bonds market do this year. If, if the equity markets, the stock markets, continue to be really strong, we could see bond yields drop, which could cause mortgage rates to drop. Uh, on the other hand, if, if the stock market reverses course, we, we could see bond yields come back up. So it's it's really anybody's guess uh, which way the market goes this year. And oh, by the way, just to throw an added level uh, of volatility into the mix, let's keep in mind, this is a presidential election year. Yeah. Uh, and by all More accounts, we're gonna, have a, we're gonna have a repeat of the last uh, two interesting folks that, that were, were the, the party candidates, and yeah. that could throw the market into a, a further tizzy. So, uh, you know, as, as the Chinese curse goes, uh, may you live in interesting times, and we certainly are these days. And don't forget, it's the year of the dragon, which is burn it down and rebuild. So, you know, just can't forget. Lovely thought. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, anyway. <laughs> What, what's happened, and, and nobody on this webinar today is surprised by this, we've all lived through it, is we saw that historic jump in mortgage rates. We've never seen mortgage rates double in a single calendar year until 2022. Uh, and they didn't just double in a calendar year, they doubled literally in a couple of months. And that was, again, because of the Fed's unprecedented actions. Uh, we also saw the biggest single monthly decline ever in January. 
uh, as the market kind of reversed course. But now we've seen rates tick up just a little bit over the last week. And so I'm, I'm going to stick to my guns and say what I've been saying for a while, which is that I believe the most likely scenario is that mortgage rates do come down over the course of 2024, but they come down slowly and gradually. And mm -hmm. don't be surprised if over the course of the next 12 months, we see them tick up a little bit before they tick back down. Uh, I think it's going to be kind of a sawtooth uh, road back down. The fact that they, they dropped as far as they did in January um, is a hopeful thing. And, and maybe what that suggests is by the end of the year, uh, we might actually be able to break the 6% uh, rate on a 30-year fixed rate loan uh, and get into the fives. So we'll, we'll be hopeful and see if that happens. I think that'll almost certainly happen for 15-year loans. Uh, and, and as most of the folks um, attending the webinar know, the, the, the private lending rates that you get uh, are typically, you know, a couple points higher than what we see on those consumer loans. Not always. Kathy has some great deals for you. Uh, but, but, you know, for the most part, you can kind of track along with what's going on in the consumer loans. And the other really odd thing that's been happening over the last year is we've seen uh, the new home builders uh, buy down mortgage rates for their buyers. Uh, I saw somebody in Denver recently advertising 4.99% mortgages. That's that's what we're homes. experiencing. That's why we had such a good year is our, the builders that we work with have, have discounted the interest rates so low that these new properties cash flow. Uh, but it costs yep. them, but it's great for the investor. So that is one of the ways that new home builders have been able to to make sales happen. And that's actually very shrewd for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is it lets them not drop the list price of their homes. Yes. Because not only would they lose money on that sale, but then it would make it harder for them to keep that list price on the next home they sold. Yep. So they're still discounting about as much as they would have, but they're doing it in a way that makes the buyer um, uh, able to, to afford that higher price point by, by lower mortgage rates. So really kind of... Yeah very savvy on the part of the builders. Yeah, they, they, they can do that in form of um, upgrades and so forth, but what's really needed is the interest rate buy down, which is, is what they've been doing. And I, I, we've got a webinar coming up with another uh, builder who's significantly reduced the interest rate. So definitely stay tuned. Rich and I have been active in buying those because they, they're locked for 10 years. It's amazing at that low rate. No, it's, it's great. I'm, I'm, glad, rate. I'm, glad, I'm glad you're sharing that too, Kathy, because a lot of the investors I talk to around the country don't think of buying new homes. And if you're, if you're a fix and flip investor, th that probably is still sound advice because it's very hard to make those numbers pencil out. But yeah. for rental property owners, um, some really great deals out there if you're looking at the new home market. Oh my gosh, this is the time to buy new homes. And let's face it, if you're an investor investing out of state, what would you rather have? You know, a, a new home or an older home? You know, it's it's obviously much easier to manage a newer home. It's how Rich and I got started. If you can make the numbers work, that should be the choice hands down every time. Um, you know, obviously we we love renovated homes as well, but right now it is an opportunity because the builder will buy down that rate. Yeah, and I, I don't have a chart in this deck, but uh, I'm working on something for another company right now that shows that single family rental prices have not declined as, as rapidly or as far as multifamily rental prices have. So yeah. again, it's, it's really a good time to be the, a single family rental property owner uh, in, in today's market, particularly when so many potential buyers are priced out uh, by the higher home prices and higher financing costs. So I'm, I'm really not doing a sales pitch for Kathy. It, it just, it, it happens to be the truth. Um, I just want to come back to mortgage rates because there's still a lot of confusion with headlines and reporters and people who don't understand that what the Fed is doing is not the same as what mortgages are doing. Uh, the Fed is simply uh, m manipulating the overnight lending rate. Mortgages are more based on mortgage-backed securities and what investors will pay. I mean, yep. did I get that right? Is that the way you would? You did. And, and the, the, the thing people can watch if they're kind of curious is, you know, track the, the yields on the 10-year U.S. Treasuries, on the 10-year bonds. There's usually a very direct correlation between 30-year mortgage rates and the yields on the 10-year. So uh, 10 years we're trading this morning with a yield of about 4%. In a normal market, that means we would be looking at an interest rate on a mortgage of 55 to 6%. And we're still probably at around 6.8%. Yeah. 
So the spread between those two is still fairly wide, and that's because of volatility and risk and resale values, as you're mentioning, Kathy, to the secondary market. So as, as, that, as that all settles down over the course of the year, I think you'll see that spread narrow. And that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm very hopeful that we'll, we'll see mortgage rates come down pretty significantly uh, over the next year or two. And yet uh, there's another factor that I had kind of forgotten about this year, and that is that the Fed stimulated the economy by buying some of those mortgage-backed securities and a lot of them. And now they're selling them and releasing that. So that in itself is a reason why mortgage rates won't go down that much, right? Because they, they've got to offload so many of the mortgage-backed securities they bought. And they've been they've been very judicious about how many of those they offload. Right now, the majority of what's coming off their books is just running off the books uh, in, in kind of due course. Either the loan's paid off uh, or it gets refied or the property gets sold and the loan is closed. So they're, they're being very careful not to flood the capital markets with a lot of low price paper um, because they, they, they don't want to upset the, the way the market is, is functioning. But yes, they, they did a lot of quantitative stimulus by buying a lot of these bonds, uh, buying a lot of these notes, and they are, are trying not, they're, they're trying, it's, it's a balancing act. So they're getting rid of some of these things as part of quantitative tightening, but they don't want to over tighten because they don't want the market to seize up. So it's, uh, it's a little bit like the push me, pull you llama in Dr. Doolittle that, that we're watching the Fed go through with these, with these notes. Um, bottom line is we recently had a little bit of a dip in, in mortgage rates. We saw a surge in mortgage applications. I, I use the word surge very advisedly. If you look at this chart, you can see that surge means it went up. But if you look at how far down it was, it, it's, I, I think, in the long run, really more like causing a blip in mortgage applications. Uh, and, and by the way, when the mortgage rates flattened out and started to go back up a little bit, we, we saw mortgage applications uh, go the opposite direction uh, more recently. So it's a very, very rate sensitive market, market when it comes to buyers. Uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit about the impact it's having on sellers as well. We have seen an increase in pending home sales. Uh, this is from uh, Altos Research. Um, and, and that's a good thing. It's a uh, 7.7% increase uh, in December. Uh, from the prior year, but keep in mind, December the prior year was incredibly weak. Uh, it was it was down 45% from the year before, so it's it's a little bit of um, you know it it looks good, but it, it's not all that great relatively speaking. That said, again, there is pent up demand. People are looking to buy if they can. If they can't afford it, they're looking to rent. If they were looking to buy a house, they'd probably be more more liked. They would probably like better to rent a house than to rent an apartment. Uh, even with the increased activity, uh, November, and that's the most recent month we have home sales available. Uh, the, we'll see we'll see some December numbers come out probably in a week and a half. Um, November is the 27th consecutive month where we've seen home sales lower on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, they were up slightly from October, and that was good because it broke a nine-month streak of month-over-month -month sales being down. But we're we're still trending at below four million. Uh, existing homes being sold over the course of the year, which would be the lowest number we've seen since probably about 2008 when we were entering the Great Recession. So a, a, a pretty low number and, and certainly lower than I had forecast this year. New home sales also declined quite a bit in November, uh, coming in at an annualized rate of about 590,000. That was down from close to 700,000 annualized the month before. Uh, and that was mostly due to interest rates spiking up in November. Uh, so again, very, uh, very interest rate sensitive market. And and as those rates had spiked and hit, you know, a, a, I, I believe a cycle high, uh, even the builders couldn't buy down the rates quite enough to, to offset those rates. So um, uh, new home sales will probably come in higher at the end of the year on a year over year basis, uh, but, but not quite as strong as you might have expected going through the, the middle part of the year. So I, I, at the beginning of the year, I had forecast about 4 million existing home sales. Uh, I had forecast about 650,000 new home sales. I think the new home sales number will come in pretty close to what I forecast. Uh, the existing home sales will probably be lower um, just because of the, uh, the, the affordability issues we're facing. 
mm -hmm. uh, and because uh, inventory of new home of existing homes uh, continues to be pretty weak. So the numbers are better year over year, but we're still only up to about three months supply of homes for sale across the country. I mentioned that we would talk about the impact those mortgage rates are having on sellers. This is the impact. Uh, there's something called rate lock or a lock-in effect. Um, about 70% of people with, a, with an active mortgage uh, have an interest rate of 4% or lower. You're sitting on a 3% mortgage and buy a new home today for exactly the same amount of money you sold yours. You've just doubled your monthly mortgage payments and most people simply can't afford that. So this isn't about homeowners being picky about a mortgage uh, rate. It's that they, the, the math doesn't work. They simply can't afford to buy a new house uh, at today's higher interest rates. Uh, what the economists tell me is that the inflection point is probably somewhere at or below five and a half percent mortgage rates. When we hit that magic number, we will start to see people be able to rationalize selling their property and buying a new one. The alternative to that is that this just plays out over time. So we, we wind up with another year or two, or maybe even three with kind of lackluster home sales numbers uh, as gradually the market converts from a low interest rate core to a kind of current interest rate core. Uh, and then trading those homes in won't be as, as painful financially for the homeowners. And we've seen that happen in the 80s and, and the early 90s. Uh, and, and that, I believe, is much more, both of those, I believe, lower mortgage rates or a kind of slow, steady uh, volume of home sales, not exciting, but steady, I think are more likely scenarios than the, the price crash that YouTube uh, snake oil salesmen are still trying to push. Uh, the dynamics, none of the data uh, show dynamics that would lead to suspect a price crash. On the new home front, we are seeing uh, single family starts recovering, that's the red line, and multifamily starts declining, that's the blue line. And that's good on two fronts. One, we, we are still probably somewhere between two and four million units short in terms of single family homes for people that want to be owner occupants. Uh, and last year we had a record number of uh, apartment units come online. Some estimates uh, as high as a million new apartment units coming online. So um, we needed to see the multifamily starts uh, slow down a bit and we needed to see single family starts come back up. They're still well below normal levels, but they're trending in the right direction. And, and that's, that's a good sign that the builders uh, have, have read the memo this time uh, and are, are trying to adjust to market demand. And, and in fact, new home inventory, if you're looking at it in total, uh, is almost back to normal levels. The, the percentages are a little off. There's still uh, a slightly higher percentage of it, basically lots that have been permitted, but the construction hasn't started. Uh, we still have a relatively high percentage of homes under construction although that's starting to revert back to normal levels uh, as, as the supply chain disruptions have, have kind of uh, lessened. Uh, and we still have a relatively low number of completed homes for sale. The builders are selling a lot of these homes while they're still under construction. But bottom line is we're, we're almost back to about a seven month supply of existing home or new homes for sale, which is, which is uh, more along the lines of what we would expect to see normally. The lack of inventory and suppressed demand, it means that home prices have been up uh, year over year in every region of the country. And that's true whether you look at the Case-Shiller report, which I, I don't have in this, which is showing a, an, an increase from the prior peak in home prices, uh, whether you're looking at the NAR numbers where we saw price appreciation declining and actually going negative for a couple of months before reversing course in June. Uh, and is now showing a year-over-year increase. This is data from the FHFA, which basically tracks the resale of, of homes that were uh, financed using F Freddie and Fannie loans. So it's the bulk of the conventional loans that are out there, and their numbers are up 6.3% year-over-year uh, as, as of the end of October. And if I'd shown you this chart, Kathy, a couple months ago, the Pacific region and the mountain region were both in negative numbers. These were regions where the prices went crazy during the pandemic uh, and kind of overshot the mark. And so we were seeing price corrections in those markets really up until about uh, September. And then they went positive and they've continued to go positive. But every region across the country right now 
uh, is showing year over year growth uh, in prices. So that's good news uh, for real estate investors uh, who own properties uh, or, or uh, well, who own properties or looking to flip properties. It's, uh, it's a little, it makes it a little tougher sometimes for numbers to pencil out for rental property investors. And I want to make the point that where you invest is critically important when you're looking at prices. So don't don't just take, and that's one of the reasons I like the FHFA numbers because they show regions. But if you boil it down to even more specific things like counties, and this is data from CoreLogic, you can see that while on average prices are up year over year, uh, there are markets where we're still looking at price declines. So Salt Lake City, Las Vegas, uh, Phoenix, uh, coastal California, the Pacific Northwest, Austin, uh, New York, uh, parts of New Jersey, you're still seeing uh, Chicago, you're still seeing prices uh, in some cases declining on a year over year basis. So it really depends on where you're investing. And uh, general rule of thumb going across the south, southeast, uh, parts of the Midwest, we're seeing you know a lot stronger price growth uh, than we're seeing in some of those other markets that I just mentioned. So it's important to know your market. Mm -hmm. And one of the things driving that is we're continuing to see migration from some of the higher cost, higher tax markets. Again, looking at you, coastal California, Seattle, Portland, uh, Boston, New York, D.C., Miami, uh, into other markets that are lower cost. And this is this is only something of interest to data geeks, Kathy, so I think you'll probably be interested in it. But one of the reasons we're seeing the Midwest and the South do so well in terms of price appreciation is because people are moving there from more expensive states. So they're paying top dollar for properties in those markets, but those properties still represent a bargain compared to where they're moving from. Mm -hmm. So that's why you're, you're still likely to see some declines in San Francisco and San Jose. But if you're in uh, Des Moines or uh, Omaha or Nashville or Jacksonville, uh, people moving into those markets are still seeing those markets as bargains and 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 paying top dollar, which is making those prices increase. Yep. And then I mentioned earlier, we've seen apartment rents drop pretty significantly year over year. Uh, they're, they're more or less flat right now. I think RealPage's most recent data suggested they might be off uh, in negative territory by less than half a point year over year. And these are asking rents for new tenants. Uh, they peaked during the pandemic at about 15% year over year. Have, coming, have been coming down steadily ever since. I'm not seeing as much of a decline in single family rents, um, but, but they've been trending down year over year as well, just not into negative territory. Anything we wanted to cover in more detail there before we move on? Just um, single family uh, rents are different than apartment rents. So yes, yeah, um, and, and we've seen uh, single family rents rise a little bit faster than apartment recently. So. Recently, that is correct. Or they, or at least they've fallen less, less dramatically. Um, yeah. And, and what we're talking, it's a good point. We're talking about price appreciation declining. It's still important to know that means you're, you're making more than you did a year ago. It's just not yeah. as much more as you did a yeah. year ago. So yeah. it's, it's still appreciating, just not as, as rapidly. So yeah, the single family market, for the most part, has held up better than the the, the apartment market has. And then, as and far as again, appreciation, the, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. You're dealing with a different different clientele, different tenant. Typically, they're a little bit better off financially. They're a little bit more established. Uh, very often, families, uh, and and so they're more stable uh, and and willing to pay a little bit more and able to pay a little bit more uh, for that extra room and that uh, that that home ownership kind of lifestyle. And families don't like to move their kids around too much and moving schools yeah. and so forth. Um, and then as far as appreciation goes, of course, uh, in certain areas, appreciation is going to be stronger than others, like you said. And in the Southeast, it just continues to be pretty impressive. Yeah, know, know thy market is probably the, the number one commandment for investors, uh, whether you're investing out of state or in state. Um, you know, what we're talking about nationally may have very little impact on what's going on in your market. And so what I always tell investors is look for, if you want to look for two underlying trends, look for population trends and job trends. Is the population growing or declining? Uh, and, and are we seeing an increase in jobs or a decrease in jobs? Are you looking at wage growth? 
or wages flattening or declining. And if you happen to be looking at a market where population is going up, jobs are going up, and wages are going up, you're probably going to have a really good, really good real estate market. Uh, and and the, the inverse is also true. Yeah. All right, delinquencies. People have been waiting for a decade for uh, foreclosure to buy foreclosures, and of course there are some, but uh, where where does it stand now, and is it increasing? Well, they're going to be waiting a little bit longer, I'm afraid, Kathy. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, delinquencies, foreclosures, and the inventory, the number of properties still in foreclosure is still down year to date. This is as of the end of October from ICE Mortgage, which used to be Black Knight. And if you look at the third column there, the year-to-date change, you can see the delinquencies are off about 7.7%. Foreclosure activity is off about 6.4%. And foreclosure starts are off almost 14% uh, on a year-to-date basis. So the percentage of loans that are either seriously delinquent or in foreclosure uh, also off pretty significantly. I mentioned that I, I sent you this deck yesterday and, and numbers changed as of today. I got some data from, from Adam, <laughs> where I used to work, who tracks foreclosures. And their year-end data um, showed that, that uh, foreclosure start activity was up about, I'm sorry, foreclosure activity overall for the year was up about 2% from last year, but off about 28% from 2019. Uh, foreclosure starts are back to about 80% of 2019 levels, and foreclosure completions are off uh, about 79% uh, uh, from, from uh, 2019 levels. So the model that investors used to, to deploy, they'd kind of watch for that foreclosure property to get repossessed by the lender, and then they'd buy it as a bank-owned home just not working in today's market. We'll, we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. So uh, national delinquency rate, um, again, from, from ICE, uh, was at 3.26% uh, in November. Uh, that's not the lowest ever historically, but boy, it's pretty close. Um, and, and normally that delinquency rate's between four and 5%. That's the black line you see there. Uh, so we're looking at below normal levels of delinquencies. Interestingly, Kathy, mortgage delinquencies have declined even while we've seen other consumer credit delinquencies go up. So consumer loans, uh, consumer credit cards, automotive loans, all of those delinquency rates have, have increased a bit over the recent months while mortgage delinquencies have declined. Partly that's due to the strength of the economy and low unemployment. If you want to look for a predictor of mortgage delinquencies, look for unemployment rates. Uh, but but partly it's also the quality of the loans that were written. Uh, mm -hmm. Underwriting standards were very tight over the last decade. Uh, and the fact that people have a lot of, of equity they don't want to risk to a foreclosure. Uh, we'll get into that in more detail in a second. Um, foreclosure starts tick up in October, back down in November. I don't have data yet to show this, but I believe they tick down again in December a bit uh, as everybody put moratoriums in place. Uh, for the holidays. Uh, so those those starts, you're only looking uh, on average at about uh, 20,000 starts a month, which is is just you know much, much lower than than what we've seen in in prior cycles. And foreclosure inventory, which is usually between one and one and a half percent of all mortgages, is still down below five, below a half a percent. Uh, so it's just, if it feels like there's nothing out there in foreclosure, it's because there's nothing out there in foreclosure. A lot of people thought the government's forbearance plan would lead to foreclosure activity. Uh, and we had eight and a half million people take advantage of that forbearance plan to, to stop making mortgage payments. Less than 1% of them have defaulted. So yeah. it's just been a remarkably successful program. Um, I've seen different equity numbers. This is the one from, from ICE. I, I've seen numbers from Adam that are actually a little stronger. But according to ICE, uh, about 80% of, of borrowers in foreclosure or 90 days delinquent have at least 20% equity in their homes. So these are people who are not inclined to let that equity go away. If you're talking about uh, the median price of a home being sold today at $400,000, and you have 20% equity there, $80,000, you don't want to risk losing that to a foreclosure. Uh, and so what's happening for a lot of those people is that they are selling those properties prior to the foreclosure sale. And this is some data from our friend Darren Bloomquist over at auction.com. Mm -hmm. He may have shown you this before, but if you look at distressed property sales 
as either properties that are in foreclosure being sold, properties sold at the auction or REOs, bank owned homes being sold. 63% of distressed property sales today are, are homeowners selling their home in the early stage of foreclosure before the foreclosure auction. So if you're an investor, uh, the rule today is track those borrowers who get that early foreclosure notice and reach out to them before the foreclosure sale. You can probably negotiate a deal that gets you a good bargain, uh, probably not as good as you would have gotten at the auction or, or as an REO, but still better than, than normal terms. And in today's market, um, um, a lot of those homes are gonna be in pretty good condition uh, because the homeowners have been maintaining them. So your repair costs might be lower. I did have one other chart to show you and you can share this with, with the attendees, Kathy. Um, this indicates kind of where you have the highest equity numbers. And unsurprisingly, it's where home prices have been going up the fastest. So again, if you're an investor looking to see where those, those distressed homeowners may have a lot of equity, uh, these are the kind of markets you're going to be looking at and the same kind of markets that we talked about. So just to kind of wrap up and then we can chat some more if you want, uh, just to kind of reca recap what we talked about. I do believe that uh, a short, mild recession, still more likely than not this year, if we don't have a recession, we'll at least see the economy slow down pretty significantly. Um, overall home sales, and that's adding up existing and new home sales. Uh, declined to about four and a half million units in, in 2023. Uh, if I'm being optimistic, I could see that number going up to about 5 million in 2024, uh, but not a return to where we were back in the pre-pandemic uh, boom times. Uh, mm -hmm. We will see mortgage rates decline. As they decline, they'll decline slowly. That's going to bring more buyers and sellers to market. So we're going to see prices increase a bit. That'll limit affordability. Uh, which will will hamper a lot of people that would like to buy a house and create more demand for rental units. So a uh, market condition should play to the advantage of, of rental property uh, investors. Um, if you're looking for foreclosure properties, you're going to continue to see limited supply because of all the reasons we talked about. There's $31 trillion in homeowner equity, uh, which is one of the reasons we're not seeing a lot of properties go to auction or repossessed by the lenders. So if you're going to be playing in that market today, you really have to fish upstream. Uh, go talk to those financially distressed homeowners, uh, and and uh, it, it, you know your next best bet obviously is to be at the foreclosure auctions themselves. But don't wait for the bank repossessions. They're they're going to be few and far between. I think foreclosure activity uh, in terms of starts will probably get back to normal levels this year sometime but I don't see auctions getting back to normal levels until at least 2025. And I don't think repossessions actually get back to normal levels until maybe 2026. It's just taking that long for uh, properties to work their way through the foreclosure pipeline. So that's all I got for you today, Kathy. Um, that's all? <laughs> that's all. I, I know it was a lot. I know we covered it pretty quickly, but um, thanks for the opportunity to, to let me share it with your your folks. Thank you. And, and what can we do for you? You're always giving for, to us and we appreciate it. You keeping us informed. Uh, what is CJ Patrick company and how do you how do you help people? We're a market intelligence firm for real estate and mortgage companies. Um, we provide um, custom market data for companies that are looking for it, uh, in, either in their region or, or nationally. Uh, we also help companies who are trying to go to market, uh, take whatever proprietary information they might have, uh, package it and, and go to market as well. So uh, we don't do work with a lot of individual investors, uh, but uh, you know, people are, are more than welcome to follow me on Twitter. I refuse to say X, because um, that's just <laughs> a dope name. Uh, or, or reach out to, to connect with me on LinkedIn. I post a lot of this information regularly. Uh, and uh, not here to sell anything, so I, I you know, you. You and I go back a long way, so I'm always happy to be uh, to be on your your web webinar and your podcast and spend some time with you. Thank you so much. We have one minute left, so can I ask one question? Somebody said, "Will we ever see home home prices come down?" Of course we will, and we're already seeing that in some markets. It it goes on a market by market basis. I think I think Austin prices were down almost 10 percent year over year last year. Uh, if you look at home prices historically, and I've done this, I really need more hobbies. Um, over time, they do tend to go up, 
but they don't go straight up. They, they, they zigzag sometimes. So uh, will we see market conditions get to a point where we'll see national home prices come down? We actually did in uh, April and May last year. Uh, so yeah, they'll, they'll come down, but historically speaking in the long run, they always wind up going back up. But at some point when we get through this limited uh, supply pent up demand stage, uh, maybe by the time the latter part of Gen Z is coming of home ownership age, uh, we, we could see a market where prices go down a bit. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all for being here during your lunch hour. And uh, we look forward to, I'm going to be interviewing Rick, you, Rick, on the Real Well Show in, in a bit. So we'll see if we've got some new data by then. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your week and weekend, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.